Well, welcome. I'm Daniel Himmelstein. I am a data scientist at the University of Pennsylvania, and it's good to be back in San Francisco because just four month, months ago, I was furiously finishing my PhD at UCSF uh, on the topics that I'll be presenting about today. So the title is HedioNet Awakens, Integrating All of Biology into a Public Neo4j Database. So I started my PhD with the question, how do you teach a computer biology? What's the best way to encode biological and medical knowledge into a computer in a way that the computer can operate and understand that information? And I decided pretty quickly that for me and for the computer, the most intuitive way would be networks with multiple nodes or relationship types. Uh, and back in the day, we had a little problem that there were at least 26 different names for this type of network, such as multi-layer network, multiplex network, overlay, composite, multi-level, heterogeneous network, heterogeneous information network. And the one that the studies we built off uh, were using was heterogeneous information network. We thought that name was too long and no one would ever want to work in a field called heterogeneous information networks. So what do you do when you have 26 different terms that you don't like? You make a 27th. Uh, so <laughs> we call our data structure a HETNET, short for heterogeneous network. The Neo4j community often will refer to the property graph. And this really is the same thing, but HETNET um, focuses on the fact that every node and relationship has a type. And that's what we wanted to bring to biomedical study that hadn't previously uh, been in network biology or medicine. So the next question was, what's the best software for storing and querying these headnets? Uh, Hedio was a piece of a Python package that I created. And over the years, it has accumulated 86 commits, has five GitHub stars, and two forks. And I don't like doing work. So when I learned that the Neo4j project offered the same functionality and more with 42,000 commits, over 3,000 stars, and 1,000 forks, I said, well, that's a thriving community that's open source that I want to be part of. So the next step was putting biology into Neo4j. And we did that just last July by releasing HedioNet version 1.0, which is a HetNet of biology designed for drug repurposing. Drug repurposing is finding new uses for existing drugs. And the motivation behind that is it's often much cheaper and safer to take drugs that we know how humans respond to and find a new use or another disease that they can treat than have to design a new compound totally from scratch. So in this network, there are 50,000 nodes of 11 types, or in Neo4j, you would call them labels. And between these 50,000 nodes are 2.25 million relationships of 24 types. And we integrated knowledge from 29 public resources. Uh, and this ended up integrating information from millions of studies. So actually, a lot of our edges will point back to the studies that that information came from. And a lot of this information was extracted through manual curation, uh, by third parties or text mining uh, or big genomic experience, uh, or experiments or sequencing. And actually the hardest part was the licensing of all this publicly available data. So what a lot of people don't realize is just because you have access to a piece of data online doesn't mean that you can use it and reproduce it and give it away however you want. Uh, and actually Nature News wrote an article on this saying legal maze threatens to slow data science. but just a little public service announcement. If you're releasing data online and you want people to use it, make sure to put an open license that allows them to do so. Here's our metagraph, which also goes by the name data model or schema. You can see the 11 different types of nodes and the 24 types of edges here. Uh, very important are the compounds and the diseases. And we know ex uh, currently what compounds are known to treat what diseases. We also put in information about genes. So for example, when a compound binds a gene, that refers to when the compound uh, physically attaches to the protein which is encoded by that gene. Another example is when a gene associates with the disease. That means that genetic variation in that gene 
influences your susceptibility to a certain disease. And there have been big studies called GWAS studies, thousands of them, which have given us a rich catalog of these relationships between genes and diseases. Those are two examples. The network contains many other relationships, which I'm happy to talk to people about afterwards. <coughs> it's hard to visualize a het net, but this was our best attempt. Each node is a tiny little dot and laid out either in a circle or in a line for the compounds and diseases. And each edge is a curved line uh, colored by its type. So this is sort of a bird's eye view or one way of looking at a het net, which should help you understand what we're dealing with. Uh, without a, a good algorithm, it's just a, um, it would be very hard to tell anything about it. But with Cypher, we can do intelligent local search and machine learning to um, do cool things, which we'll talk about next. But first, we host this network in a public Neo4j instance at neo4j.head.io. And as far as I know, we are the only people hosting a completely public Neo4j instance. So maybe we're crazy, but if you go to that, you'll get a Neo4j browser. Um, let's hope it continues working for the live demo with everyone going on. But we use a customized Docker image to deploy it on a DigitalOcean droplet. And it has SSL from Let's Let's encrypt. It's read-only mode with a query execution timeout. So that should mean that you can't mess with it too much, although who knows. <laughs> it has a custom uh, display node style or visual style, which you can define with something called grass. And we have custom browser guides to uh, point our users to cool things. And this is what it looks like. It looks like it's still running. Here we have a little um, here's the guide I was talking about, which is a new thing sort of that Neo4j has created. Here we is a query that will find a random re relationship of every type in the network. It's going to take a few seconds to run because it actually has to scan through every, um, every relationship and pick a random one per type. And if we turn off autocomplete, you can see the 24 different edges. Uh, the nodes are colored by, by the uh, nodes on each end. And then you can start to appreciate how connected the network is if we enable autocomplete, which draws connections which weren't requested but are in the network. And you see we have a highly connected picture of biology and medicine. So we try to apply this to drug repurposing or predicting new uses for existing drugs in a project we codenamed Repetio. So HedioNet version 1 contains about 1,500 connected compounds, 136 connected diseases, which between them, if you take the product of that, you get over 200,000 compound disease pairs. Each compound disease pair is a potential treatment that we would like to know the probability of whether it could have drug efficacy. We do currently know about 755 treatments. These are things that your doctor would give you a medication for if you had a, a, a certain disease. So the way that we decided to understand the relationship between a compound and a disease is to look along certain types of paths, which we call metapaths. So if you look for uh, the different types of paths that can connect a compound to disease with length four or less, there are 1,206 of them based on our uh, metagraph or schema that I showed you before, which is a lot of computation, but we were able to do. And so for each of these 200,000 compound disease pairs, we compute the prevalence of a bunch of different types of paths and then use a machine learning classifier to identify the patterns in the network or the paths that are predictive of treatment or efficacy. And through that, we're able to predict the probability of treatment for all 200,000 compound disease pairs. Now, these predictions are in line at het.io slash repurpose, and you're free to use them however you'd like. What we found was cool is that those 755 treatments which are known were ranked very highly by our approach. Uh, as you can see by how weight this violin plot's really weighted in the high percentiles. Even more interesting, potentially, is that 
drugs in clinical trial, which will be the drugs of tomorrow and potentially future treatments, we were also able to prioritize them highly based on our predictions. So now let's get to a specific example. Bupropion, does it treat nicotine dependence? It was first approved for depression in 1985, so that was the disease it was developed for. But due to the serendipitous observation that people who were taking the medication for depression also were less prone to smoke, uh, that led to it being approved in 1997 for smoking cessation. So we ask, can we predict this using our network and what is the basis of that prediction? So we happened to score this treatment highly. It was in the 99.5th percentile for nicotine dependence and that's a probability 2.5 fold greater than we'd expect. Some of the paths uh, that our approach predicts to be meaningful are that bupropion uh, causes terminal insomnia as a side effect, which is also caused by varenicline, which is another approved treatment for nicotine dependence. Sometimes when two drugs share a specific side effect, it's because they have a similar mechanism of action, and that could be harnessed for a potential future treatment. Next, bupropion binds to this CHRNA3 gene, which is also bound by varenicline, more evidence that these two drugs could be doing something similar. Furthermore, there's an association between the gene and nicotine dependence, which gives a good indication that that gene has some involvement in the disease. And then we have many pathways which this gene participates in. The pathways are the orange circles that other nicotine dependence associated genes participate in. So these are the 10 paths that our approach finds most supportive of this prediction. And you can see this in the Neo4j browser in an interactive way. For each prediction, we have a little interactive guide. So I can show you the same thing we just looked at here, and you can move it around and play with it, as well as also see some tables. And finally, uh, here's some advanced cipher queries for those who are interested. If we wanted to find all of those, pathway, or those paths that go through the pathways, uh, we could use this query. I'll let you look at it on its own time, but this is the way that we weight when you have multiple paths of the same type, how we weight them, and we do that by paths which are more specific. So uh, if you go through a really high degree node, you get downweighted because you're likely less specific. So if this works, here are 10 paths which go from bupropion to nicotine dependence through these pathways. Okay, how much more? Ah, I'm a little over time, but this is my final slide, so what a great coincidence. A lot of special thanks, um, especially, let me just skip to all the people at Neo4j who helped me on Stack Overflow and GitHub. It's really been a fantastic community to be part of, and there are a lot of resources here if you're interested in. Yeah, uh, do we have time for any questions? Questions outside. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh.